The Man Who Knew by Edgar Wallace. The Man in the Laboratory. The room was a small one and had been chosen for its remoteness from the dwelling rooms. It had formed the billiard room, which the former owner of Wheeled Lodge had added to his premises, and John Minnett, who had neither the time nor the patience for billiards, had readily handed over this damp annex to his scientific secretary. Along one side ran a plain deal bench, which was crowded with glass stills and test tubes. In the middle was as plain a table, with half a dozen books, a microscope under a glass shade, a little wooden case which was open to display an array of delicate scientific instruments, a Bunsen burner, which was burning bluely under a small glass bowl, half filled with a dark and turgid concoction of some kind. The face of the man sitting at the table watching this unsavory stew was hidden behind a mica and rubber mask, for the fumes which were being given off by the fluid were neither pleasant nor healthy. Save for a shaded light upon the table and the blue glow of the Bunsen lamp, the room was in darkness. Now and again the student would take a glass rod, dip it for an instant into the boiling liquid, and lifting it, would allow the liquid drop by drop to fall from the rod onto a strip of litmus paper. What he saw was evidently satisfactory, and presently he turned out the Bunsen lamp, walked to the window and opened it, and switched on an electric fan to aid the process of ventilation. He removed his mask, revealing the face of a good-looking young man, rather pale, with a slight dark moustache and heavy black wavy hair. He closed the window, filled his pipe from the well-worn pouch which he took from his pocket, and began to write in a notebook, stopping now and again to consult some authority from the books before him. In half an hour he had finished this work, had blotted and closed his book, and pushing back his chair gave himself up to reverie. They were not pleasant thoughts to judge by his face. He pulled from his inside pocket a leather case and opened it. From this he took a photograph. It was the picture of a girl of sixteen. It was a pretty face, a little sad, but attractive in its very weakness. He looked at it for a long time, shaking his head as at an unpleasant thought. There came a gentle tap at the door, and quickly he replaced the photograph in his case, folded it, and returned it to his pocket as he rose to unlock the door. John Minnett, who entered, sniffed suspiciously. "'What beastly smells you have in here, Jasper!' he growled. "'Why on earth don't they invent chemicals that are more agreeable to the nose?' Jasper Cole laughed quietly. "'I'm afraid, sir, that nature has ordered it otherwise,' he said. "'Have you finished?' asked his employer. He looked at the still warm bowl of fluid suspiciously. "'It is all right, sir,' said Jasper. "'It is only noxious when it is boiling.' That is why I keep the door locked. What is it? asked John Minnett, scowling down at the unoffending liquor. It is many things, said the other ruefully. In point of fact, it is an experiment. The bowl contains one or two elements which will only mix with the others at a certain temperature. And as an experiment, it is successful because I have kept the unmixable elements in suspension, though the liquid has gone cold. I hope you will enjoy your dinner, even though it has gone cold, grumbled John Minnett. I didn't hear the bell, sir, said Jasper Cole. I'm awfully sorry if I've kept you waiting. They were the only two present in the big black-looking dining room, and dinner was, as usual, a fairly silent meal. John Minnett read the newspapers, particularly that portion of them which dealt with the latest fluctuations in the stock market. Somebody has been buying Guello Deeps, he complained loudly. Jasper looked up. Guello Deeps, he said. But they are the shares... Yes, yes, said the other testily. I know. They were quoted at a shilling last week. They are up to two shillings and threepence. I've got five hundred thousand of them. To be exact, he corrected himself, I've got a million of them. Though half of them are not my property. I am almost tempted to sell. Perhaps they have found gold, suggested Jasper. John Minnett snorted. If there is gold in the Guello Deeps, there are diamonds on the downs, he said scornfully. By the way, the other 500,000 shares belong to May. Jasper Cole raised his eyebrows as much in interrogation as in surprise. John Minnett leaned back in his chair and manipulated his gold toothpick. May Nuttall's father was the best friend I ever had, he said gruffly. He lured me into the Guello Deeps against my better judgment, 
We sank a bore 3,000 feet and found everything except gold. He gave one of his brief rumbling chuckles. I wish that mine had been a success. Poor old Bill Nuttle. He helped me in some tight places. And I think you have done your best for his daughter, sir. She's a nice girl, said John Minnick, a dear girl. I'm not taken with girls. He made a wry face. But May is as honest and as sweet as they make them. She's the sort of girl who looks you in the eye when she talks to you. There's no damn nonsense about May. Jasper Cole concealed a smile. What the devil are you grinning at? demanded John Minnett. I also was thinking that there was no nonsense about her, he said. John Minnett swung round. Jasper, he said. May is the kind of girl I would like you to marry. In fact, she is the girl I would like you to marry. I think Frank would have something to say about that, said the other, stirring his coffee. Frank, snorted John Minnett. What the devil do I care about Frank? Frank has to do as he's told. He's a lucky young man and a bit of a rascal too, I'm thinking. Frank would marry anybody with a pretty face. Why, if I hadn't interfered... Jasper looked up. Yes? Never mind, growled John Minnett. As was his practice, he sat a long time over dinner, half awake and half asleep. Jasper had annexed one of the newspapers and was reading it. This was the routine which marked every evening of his life save on those occasions when he made a visit to London. He was in the midst of an article by a famous scientist on radium emanation when John Minnett continued a conversation which he had broken off an hour ago. I'm worried about May sometimes. Jasper put down his paper. Worried? Why? I am worried. Isn't that enough? growled the other. I wish you wouldn't ask me a lot of questions, Jasper. You irritate me beyond endurance. Well, I'll take it that you're worried, said his confidential secretary patiently, and that you've good reason. I feel responsible for her, and I hate responsibilities of all kinds. The responsibilities of children. He winced and changed the subject, nor did he return to it for several days. Instead, he opened up a new line. Sergeant Smith was here when I was out, I understand, he said. He came this afternoon, yes. Did you see him? Jasper nodded. What did he want? He wanted to see you as far as I could make out. You were saying the other day that he drinks. Drinks, said the other scornfully. He doesn't drink, he eats it. What do you think about Sergeant Smith, he demanded. I think he is a very curious person, said the other frankly and I can't understand why you go to such trouble to shield him or why you send him money every week. One of these days you'll understand, said the other, and his prophecy was to be fulfilled. For the present, it is enough to say that if there are two ways out of a difficulty, one of which is unpleasant and one of which is less unpleasant, I take the less unpleasant of the two. It is less unpleasant to pay Sergeant Smith a weekly stipend than it is to be annoyed and I should most certainly be annoyed if I did not pay him. He rose up slowly from the chair and stretched himself. Sergeant Smith, he said again, is a pretty tough proposition. I know, and I have known him for years. In my business, Jasper, I have had to know some queer people, and have had to do some queer things. I'm not so sure that they would look well in print, though I am not sensitive as to what newspapers say about me, or I should have been in my grave years ago. But Sergeant Smith and his knowledge touches me at a raw place. You are always messing about with narcotics and muck of all kinds, and you will understand when I tell you that the money I give Sergeant Smith every week serves a double purpose. It is an opiate and a prof... Uh, prophylactic, suggested the other. That's the word, said John Minnett. I was never a whale at the Longans. When I was twelve I couldn't write my own name, and when I was nineteen I used to spell it with two N's. He chuckled again. Opiate and prophylactic, he repeated, nodding his head. That's Sergeant Smith. He is a dangerous devil because he is a rascal. Constable Wiseman, began Jasper. Constable Wiseman, snapped John Minnett, rubbing his hand through his rumpled gray hair, is a dangerous devil because he's a fool. What has Constable Wiseman been here about? He didn't come here, smiled Jasper. I met him on the road and had a little talk with him. He might have been better employed, said John Minnett gruffly. That silly ass has summoned me three times. 
One of these days I'll get him thrown out of the force. He's not a bad sort of fellow, sued Jasper Cole. He's rather stupid, but otherwise he's a decent, well-conducted man with a sense of the law. Did he say anything worth repeating? asked John Minnett. He was saying that Sergeant Smith is a disciplinarian. I know of nobody more of a disciplinarian than Sergeant Smith, said the other sarcastically, particularly when he is getting over a jag. The keenest sense of duty is that possessed by a man who has broken the law and has not been found out. I think I will go to bed, he added, looking at the clock on the mantelpiece. I am going up to town tomorrow. I want to see May. Is anything worrying you? asked Jasper. The bank is worrying me, said the old man. Jasper Cole looked at him steadily. What's wrong with the bank? There is nothing wrong with the bank, and the knowledge that my dear nephew Frank Merrill Esquire is accountant at one of its branches removes any lingering doubt in my mind as to its stability. And I wish to heaven you'd get out of the habit of asking me why this happens or why I do that. Jasper lit a cigar before replying. The only way you can find things out in this world is by asking questions. Well, ask somebody else, boomed John Minnett at the door. Jasper took up his paper, but was not to be left to the enjoyment its columns offered. For five minutes later, John Minnett appeared in the doorway, minus his tie and coat, having been surprised in the act of undressing with an idea which called for development. Send a cable in the morning to the manager of the Guello Deeps and ask him if there is any report. By the way, you are the secretary of the company. I suppose you know that. Am I? asked the startled Jasper. Frank was, and I don't suppose he has been doing the work now. You had better find out or you will be getting me into a lot of trouble with the registrar. We ought to have a board meeting. Am I the directors too? asked Jasper innocently. It is very likely, said John Minnett. I know I am chairman, but there has never been any need to hold a meeting. You had better find out from Frank when the last was held. He went away to reappear a quarter of an hour later, this time in his pajamas. That Mission May is running, he began. They are probably short of money. You might inquire of their secretary. They will have a secretary. I'll be bound. If they want anything, send it on to them. He walked to the sideboard and mixed himself a whiskey and soda. I've been out the last three or four times Smith has called. If he comes tomorrow, tell him I will see him when I return. Bolt the doors and don't leave it to that jackass Wilkins. Jasper nodded. You think I am a little mad, don't you, Jasper? asked the older man, standing by the sideboard with the glass in his hand. That thought has never occurred to me, said Jasper. I think you are eccentric sometimes and inclined to exaggerate the dangers which surround you. The other shook his head. I shall die a violent death. I know it. When I was in Zululand, an old witch doctor tossed the bones. You have never had that experience? I can't say that I have, said Jasper with a little smile. You can laugh at that sort of thing, but I tell you I've got a great faith in it. Once in the king's crawl and once in Etchaway it happened, and both witch doctors told me the same thing, that I die by violence. I didn't used to worry about it very much, but I suppose I'm growing old now, and living surrounded by the laws that were... I am too law-abiding. A law-abiding man is one who is afraid of people who are not law-abiding, and I am getting to that stage. You laugh at me because I'm jumpy whenever I see a stranger hanging around the house, but I have got more enemies to the square yard than most people have to the county. I suppose you think I am subject to delusions and ought to be put under restraint. A rich man hasn't a very happy time, he went on, speaking half to himself and half to the young man. I've met all sorts of people in this country and been introduced as John Minnett, the millionaire. And do you know what they say as soon as my back is turned? Jasper offered no suggestion. They say this, John Minnett went on, whether they're young or old, good, bad, or indifferent, I wish he'd die and leave me some of his money. Jasper laughed softly. You haven't a very good opinion of humanity. I have no opinion of humanity, corrected his chief and I am going to bed. Jasper heard his heavy feet upon the stairs and the thud of them overhead. He waited for some time, then heard the bed creak. He closed the windows, personally inspecting the fastenings of the doors, and went to his little office study on the first floor. 
He shut the door, took out the pocket case, and gave one glance at the portrait, and then took an unopened letter which had come that evening and which, by his deft handling of the mail, he had been able to smuggle into his pocket without John Minnett's observance. He slid open the envelope, extracted the letter, and read, Dear Sir, your esteemed favor is to hand. We have to thank you for the check, and we are very pleased that we have given you satisfactory service. The search has been a very long and, I am afraid, a very expensive one to yourself, but now that discovery has been made, I trust you will feel rewarded for your energies. The note bore no heading, and was signed J. B. Fleming. Jasper read it carefully, and then, striking a match, lit the paper and watched it burn in the grate. End of chapter 1 The Girl Who Cried the Northern Express had deposited its passengers at King's Cross on time. All station approaches were crowded with hurrying passengers. Taxicabs and growlers were mixed in apparently inextricable confusion. There was a roaring babble of instruction and counter-instruction from policemen, from cab drivers, and from excited porters. Some of the passengers hurried swiftly across the broad asphalt space and disappeared down the stairs toward the underground station. Others waited for unpunctual friends with protesting and frequent examination of their watches. One alone seemed wholly bewildered by the noise and commotion. She was a young girl, not more than eighteen, and she struggled with two or three brown paper parcels, a hat box, and a bulky handbag. She was among those who expected to be met at the station, for she looked helplessly at the clock and wandered from one side of the building to the other, till at last she came to a standstill in the center put down all her parcels carefully, and, taking a letter from a shabby little bag, opened it and read. Evidently she saw something which she had not noticed before, for she hastily replaced the letter in the bag, scrambled together her parcels, and walked swiftly out of the station. Again she came to a halt and looked round the darkened courtyard. Here, snapped a voice irritably. She saw a door of a taxicab open and came toward it timidly. "'Come in, come in, for heaven's sake,' said the voice. She put in her parcels and stepped into the cab. The owner of the voice closed the door with a bang, and the taxi moved on. "'I've been waiting here ten minutes,' said the man in the cab. "'I'm so sorry, dear, but I didn't read—' "'Of course you didn't read,' interrupted the other brusquely. It was the voice of a young man not in the best of tempers, and the girl, folding her hands in her lap, prepared for the tirade which he knew was to follow her act of omission. "'You never seem to be able to do anything right,' said the man. "'I suppose it is your natural stupidity.' "'Why couldn't you meet me inside the station?' she asked with some show of spirit. "'I've told you a dozen times that I don't want to be seen with you,' said the man brutally. "'I've had enough trouble over you already. I wish to heaven I'd never met you.' The girl could have echoed that wish but eighteen months of bullying had cowed and all but broken her spirit. "'You are a stone around my neck,' said the man bitterly. "'I have to hide you, and all the time I am in a fret as to whether you will give me away or not. "'I'm going to keep you under my eye now,' he said. "'You know a little too much about me.' "'I should never say a word against you,' protested the girl. "'I hope for your sake you don't,' was the grim reply." The conversation slackened from this moment until the girl plucked up courage to ask where they were going. "'Wait and see,' snapped the man, but added later, "'You are going to a much nicer home than you have ever had in your life, and you ought to be very thankful.' "'Indeed I am, dear,' said the girl earnestly. "'Don't call me dear,' snarled her husband. The cab took them to Camden Town, and they descended in front of a respectable-looking house in a long, dull street. It was too dark for the girl to take stock of her surroundings, and she had scarcely time to gather her parcels together before the man opened the door and pushed her in. The cab drove off, and a motorcyclist who all the time had been following the taxi wheeled his machine slowly from the corner of the street where he had waited until he came opposite the house. He let down the supports of his machine, went stealthily up the steps, and flashed a lamp upon the enamel numbers over the fanlight of the door. He jotted down the figures in a notebook, descended the steps again, and, wheeling his machine back a little way, mounted and rode off. 
Half an hour later, another cab pulled up at the door, and a man descended, telling the driver to wait. He mounted the steps, knocked, and after a short delay was admitted. "'Hello, Crawley,' said the man who had opened the door to him. "'How goes it?' "'Rotten,' said the newcomer. "'What do you want me for?' His was the voice of an uncultured man, but his tone was that of an equal. "'What do you think I want you for?' asked the other savagely. He led the way to the sitting room, struck a match, and lit the gas. His bag was on the floor. He picked it up, opened it, and took out a flask of whiskey which he handed to the other. "'I thought you might need it,' he said sarcastically. Crowley took the flask, poured out a stiff tot, and drank it at a gulp. He was a man of fifty, dark and dour. His face was lined and tanned as one who had lived for many years in a hot climate. This was true of him for he had spent ten years of his life in the Matabella land mounted police. The young man pulled up a chair to the table. "'I've got an offer to make to you,' he said. "'Is there any money in it?' The other laughed. "'You don't suppose I should make any kind of offer to you that hadn't money in it?' he answered contemptuously. Crawley, after a moment's hesitation, poured out another drink and gulped it down. "'I haven't had a drink today,' he said apologetically. That is an obvious lie, said the younger man, but now to get to business. I don't know what your game is in England, but I will tell you what mine is. I want a free hand, and I can only have a free hand if you take your daughter away out of the country. You want to get rid of her, eh? asked the other, looking at him shrewdly. The young man nodded. I tell you, she's a millstone round my neck, he said for the second time that evening, and I'm scared of her. At any moment, she might do some fool thing and ruin me. Crawley grinned. For better or for worse, he quoted, and then seeing the ugly look in the other man's face, he said, Don't try to frighten me, Mr. Brown or Jones or whatever you call yourself, because I can't be frightened. I have had to deal with worse men than you, and I'm still alive. I'll tell you right now that I'm not going out of England. I've got a big game on. What did you think of offering me? A thousand pounds, said the other. I thought it would be something like that, said Crawley coolly. It is a flea bite to me. You take my tip and find another way of keeping her quiet. A clever fellow like you, who knows more about dope than any other man I have met, ought to be able to do the trick without any assistance from me. Why, didn't you tell me that you knew a drug that sapped the willpower of people and made them do just as you like? That's the knockout drop to give her. Take my tip and try it. You won't accept my offer? asked the other. Crawley shook his head. I've got a fortune in my hand if I work my cards right, he said. I've managed to get a position right under the old devil's nose. I see him every day, and I have got him scared. What's a thousand pounds to me? I've lost more than a thousand on one race at lose. No, my boy, employ the resources of science, he said flippantly. There's no sense in being a dope merchant if you can't get the right dope for the right case. The less you say about my doping, the better, snarled the other man. I was a fool to take you so much into my confidence. Don't lose your temper, said the other, raising his hand in mock alarm. Lord bless us, Mr. Wright or Robinson, who would have thought that the nice, mild-mannered young man who goes to church in Eastbourne could be such a fierce chap in London? I've often laughed seeing you walk past me as though butter wouldn't melt in your mouth and everybody saying what a nice young man Mr. So-and-so is, and I have thought, if they only knew that this sleek lad... Shut up, said the other savagely. You are getting as much of a danger as this infernal girl. You take things too much to heart, said the other. Now I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm not going out of England. I'm going to keep my present menial job. You see, it isn't only the question of money but I have an idea that your old man has got something up his sleeve for me, and the only way to prevent unpleasant happenings is to keep close to him. I have told you a dozen times he has nothing against you, said the other emphatically. I know his business, and I have seen most of his private papers. If he could have caught you with the goods, he would have had you long ago. I told you that the last time you called at the house and I saw you. What, you think that John Minnett would pay blackmail if he could get out of it? You were a fool. Maybe I am, said the other philosophically, but I am not such a fool as you think me to be. You had better see her, said his toast suddenly. 
Crawley shook his head. A parent's feelings, he protested, have a sense of decency. Reginald or Horace or Hector, I always forget your London name. No, he said, I won't accept your suggestion, but I have got a proposition to make to you, and it concerns a certain relative of John Minnett, a nice young fellow who will one day secure the old man's swag. Will he, said the other between his teeth. They sat for two hours discussing the proposition, and then Crawley rose to leave. I leave my final jar for the last, he said pleasantly. He had finished the contents of the flask and was in a very amiable frame of mind. You are in some danger, my young friend, and I, your guardian angel, have discovered it. You have a valet at one of your numerous addresses. A chauffeur, corrected the other. A Swede, Janssen. Crawley nodded. I thought he was a Swede. Have you seen him? asked the other quickly. He came down to make some inquiries in Eastbourne, said Crawley, and I happened to meet him. One of those talkative fellows who opens his heart to a uniform. I stopped him from going to the house, so I saved you a shock, if John Minnett had been there, I mean. The other bit his lips, and his face showed his concern. That's bad, he said. He has been very restless and rather impertinent lately, and has been looking for another job. What did you tell him? I told him to come down next Wednesday, said Crawley. I thought you'd like to make a few arrangements in the meantime. He held out his hand, and the young man, who did not mistake the gesture, dived into his pockets with a scowl and handed four or five pound notes into the outstretched palm. It will just pay my taxi, said Crawley lightheartedly. The other went upstairs. He found the girl sitting where he had left her in her bedroom. Clear out of here, he said roughly. I want the room. Meekly she obeyed. He locked the door behind her, lifted a suitcase onto the bed, and, opening it, took out a small Japanese box. From this he removed a tiny glass pestle and mortar, six little vials, a hypodermic syringe, and a small spirit lamp. Then from his pocket he took a cigarette case and removed two cigarettes, which he laid carefully on the dressing table. He was busy for the greater part of the hour. As for the girl... She spent that time in the cold dining room, huddled up in a chair, weeping softly to herself. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Man Who Knew by Edgar Wallace This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Four Important Characters The writer pauses here to say that the story of The Man Who Knew is an unusual one. It is reconstructed partly from the reports of a certain trial, partly from the confidential matter which has come into the writer's hands from Saul Arthur Mann and his extraordinary bureau, and partly from the private diary which May Nuttall put at the writer's disposal. Those practiced readers who begin this narrative with the weary conviction that they are merely to see the workings out of a conventional record of crime, of love, and of mystery, may be urged to pursue their investigations to the end. Truth is stranger than fiction, and has need to be, since most fiction is founded on truth. There is a strangeness in the story of the man who knew, which brings it into the category of voracious history. It cannot be said in truth that any story begins at the beginning of the first chapter, since all stories began with the creation of the world. But this present story may be said to begin when we cut into the lives of some of the characters concerned. Upon the seventeenth day of July, Nineteen. There was a little group of people about the prostrate figure of a man who lay upon the sidewalk in Gray Square, Bloomsbury. The hour was eight o'clock on a warm summer evening, and that the unusual spectacle attracted only a small crowd may be explained by the fact that Gray Square is a professional quarter, given up to the offices of lawyers, surveyors, and corporation offices, which at eight o'clock on a summer's day are empty of occupants. The unprofessional classes who inhabit the shabby streets impinging upon the Euston Road do not include Gray Square in their itinerary when they take their evening constitutionals abroad, and even the loud children find a less depressing environment for their games. The gray-faced youth sprawled upon the pavement was decently dressed and was obviously of the superior servant type. He was as obviously dead. Death, which beautifies and softens the plainest, had failed entirely to dissipate the impression of meanness in the face of the stricken man. 
The lips were set in a little sneer. The half-closed eyes were small. The clean-shaven jaw was long and underhung. The ears were large and grotesquely prominent. A constable stood by the body, waiting for the arrival of the ambulance, answering in monosyllables the questions of the curious. Ten minutes before the ambulance arrived, there joined the group a man of middle age. He wore the pepper-and-salt suit which distinguishes the country excursionist taking the day off in London. He had little side-whiskers and a heavy brown moustache. His golf cap was new and set at a somewhat rakish angle on his head. Across his waistcoat was a large and heavy chain hung at intervals with small silver medals. For all his provincial appearance, his movements were decisive and suggested authority. He elbowed his way through the little crowd and met the constable's disapproving stare without faltering. "'Can I be of any help, mate?' he said, and introduced himself as Police Constable Wiseman of the Sussex Constabulary. A London constable thawed. "'Thanks,' he said. "'You can help me get him into the ambulance when he comes.' "'Fit?' asked the newcomer. The policeman shook his head. He was seen to stagger and fall, and by the time I arrived he'd snuffed out. Heart disease, I suppose." Ah, said Constable Wiseman, regarding the body with a proprietorial and professional eye, and retailed his own experiences of similar tragedies, not without pride, as though he had to some extent the responsibility for their occurrence. On the far side of the square a young man and a girl were walking slowly. A tall, fair, good-looking youth he was, who might have attracted attention even in a crowd. But more likely would that attention have been focused, had he been accompanied by the girl at his side, for she was by every standard beautiful. They reached the corner of Tabor Street, and it was the fixed and eager stare of a little man who stood on the corner of the street and the intensity of his gaze which first directed their attention to the tragedy on the opposite side of the square. The little man who watched was dressed in an ill-fitting frock coat, trousers which seemed too long, since they concertinaed over his boots, and a glossy silk hat set at the back of his head. "'What a funny old thing!' said Frank Merrill under his breath, and the girl smiled. The object of their amusement turned sharply as they came abreast of him. His freckled, clean-shaven face looked strangely old, and the big gold-rimmed spectacles bridged halfway down his nose added to his ludicrous appearance. He raised his eyebrows and surveyed the two young people. "'There's an accident over there,' he said briefly and without any preliminary. "'Indeed,' said the young man politely. There have been several accidents in Gray Square, said the strange old man meditatively. It was when in 1875, when the corner house, you can see the end of it from here, collapsed and buried fourteen people, seven of whom were killed, four of whom were injured for life, and three of whom escaped with minor injuries. He said this calmly and apparently without any sense that he was acting at all unconventionally in volunteering the information, and went on, there was another accident in 1881, on the 17th of October, a collision between two handsome cabs, which resulted in the death of a driver whose name was Samuel Green. He lived at 14 Portington Mews, and had a wife and nine children. The girl looked at the old man with a little apprehension, and Frank Merrill laughed. You have a very good memory for this kind of thing. Do you live here? he asked. Oh, no! The little man shook his head vigorously. He was silent for a moment, and then, I think we had better go over and see what it is all about, he said with a certain gravity. His assumption of leadership was a little staggering, and Frank turned to the girl. Do you mind? he asked. She shook her head, and the three passed over the road to the little group, just as the ambulance came jangling into the square. To Merrill's surprise, the policeman greeted the little man respectfully, touching his helmet. I'm afraid nothing could be done, sir. He is gone. "'Oh, yes, he's gone,' said the other quite calmly. He stooped down, turned back the man's coat, and slipped his hand into the inside pocket, but drew blank. The pocket was empty. With an extraordinary rapidity of movement, he continued his search, and to the astonishment of Frank Merrill, the policeman did not deny his right. In the top left-hand pocket of the waistcoat, he pulled out a crumpled slip, which proved to be a newspaper clipping. "'Ah,' said the little man, an advertisement for a manservant cut out of this morning's Daily Telegraph. I saw it myself. Evidently a manservant who was on his way to interview a new employer. You see, 
Call at 8.30 at Holborn Viaduct Hotel. He was taking a shortcut when his illness overcame him. I know who is advertising for the valet, he added gratuitously. He is a Mr. T. Burton, who is a rubber factor from Penang. Mr. T. Burton married the daughter of the Reverend George Smith of Scarborough in 1889 and has four children, one of whom is at Winchester. Hmm. He pursed his lips and looked down again at the body. Then suddenly he turned to Frank Merrill. Do you know this man? he demanded. Frank looked at him in astonishment. No. Why do you ask? You were looking at him as though you did, said the little man. That is to say, you were not looking at his face. People who do not look at other people's faces under these circumstances know them. Curiously enough, said Frank with a little smile, there is someone here I know, and he caught the eye of Constable Wiseman. That ornament of the Sussex Constabulary touched his cap. I thought I recognized you, sir. I have often seen you at Weald Lodge, he said. Further conversation was cut short as they lifted the body onto a stretcher and put it into the interior of the ambulance. A little group watched the white car disappear, and the crowd of idlers began to melt away. Constable Wiseman took a professional leave of his comrade and came back to Frank a little shyly. You are Mr. Minnett's nephew, aren't you, sir? he asked. Quite right, said Frank. I used to see you at your uncle's place. Uncle's name? It was the little man's pert but wholly inoffensive inquiry. He seemed to ask it as a matter of course and as one who had the right to be answered without equivocation. Frank Merrill laughed. My uncle is Mr. John Minnett, he said, and added with a faint touch of sarcasm, You probably know him. Oh, yes, said the other readily. One of the original Rhodesian pioneers who received a concession from Lo Bengula and amassed a large fortune by the sale of gold mining properties which proved to be of no especial value. He was tried at Salisbury in 1897 with the murder of two Mashona chiefs and was acquitted. He amassed another fortune in Johannesburg in the boom of 97 and came to this country in 1901, settling on a small estate between Polegate and Eastbourne. He has one nephew, his heir, Frank Merrill, the son of the late Dr. Henry Merrill, who is an accountant in the London and Western Counties Bank. He... Frank looked at him in undisguised amazement. You know my uncle? Never met him in my life, said the little man brusquely. He took off his silk hat with a sweep. I wish you a good afternoon, he said, and strode rapidly away. The uniformed policeman turned a solemn face upon the group. Do you know that gentleman? asked Frank. The constable smiled. Oh, yes, sir, that is Mr. Mann. At the yard we call him the man who knows. Is he a detective? The constable shook his head. From what I understand, sir, he does a lot of work for the commissioner and for the government. We have orders never to interfere with him or refuse him any information that we can give. The man who knows, repeated Frank with a puzzled frown. What an extraordinary person. What does he know? he asked suddenly. Everything, said the constable comprehensively. A few minutes later, Frank was walking slowly toward Holborn. You seem to be rather depressed, smiled the girl. Confound that fellow, said Frank, breaking his silence. I wonder how he comes to know all about Uncle. He shrugged his shoulders. Well, dear, this is not a very cheery evening for you. I did not bring you out to see accidents. Frank, said the girl suddenly, I seem to know that man's face, the man who was on the pavement, I mean. She stopped with a shudder. It seemed a little familiar to me, said Frank thoughtfully. Didn't he pass us about twenty minutes ago? He may have done, said Frank, but I have no particular recollection of it. My impression of him goes much further back than this evening. Now, where could I have seen him? Let's talk about something else, she said quickly. I haven't a very long time. What am I to do about your uncle? He laughed. I hardly know what to suggest, he said. I am very fond of Uncle John, and I hate to run counter to his wishes, but I am certainly not going to allow him to take my love affairs into his hands. I wish to heaven you had never met him. She gave a little gesture of despair. It is no use wishing things like that, Frank. You see, I knew your uncle before I knew you. If it had not been for your uncle, I should not have met you. Tell me what happened, he asked, 
He looked at his watch. You had better come on to Victoria, he said, or I shall lose my train. He hailed the taxicab, and on the way to the station, she told him of all that had happened. He was very nice, as he always is, and he said nothing really which was very horrid about you. He merely said he did not want me to marry you because he did not think you'd make a suitable husband. He said that Jasper had all the qualities and most of the virtues. Frank frowned. Jasper is a sleek brute, he said viciously. She laid her hand on his arm. Please be patient, she said. Jasper has said nothing whatever to me and has never been anything but most polite and kind. I know that variety of kindness, growled the young man. He is one of those sly, soft-footed sneaks you can never get to the bottom of. He is worming his way into my uncle's confidence to an extraordinary extent. Why, he is more like a son to Uncle John than a beastly secretary. He has made himself necessary, said the girl, and that is halfway to making yourself wealthy. The little frown vanished from Frank's brow and he chuckled. That is almost an epigram, he said. What did you tell Uncle? I told him that I did not think that his suggestion was possible and that I did not care for Mr. Cole, nor he for me. You see, Frank, I owe your Uncle John so much. I am the daughter of one of his best friends, and since dear Daddy died, Uncle John has looked after me. He has given me my education, my income, my everything. He has been a second father to me. Frank nodded. I recognize all the difficulties, he said, and here we are at Victoria. She stood on the platform and watched the train pull out and waved her hand in farewell, and then returned to the pretty flat in which John Minnett had installed her. As she said, her life had been made very smooth for her. There was no need for her to worry about money, and she was able to devote her days to the work she loved best. The East End Providence Society, of which she was president, was wholly financed by the Rhodesian millionaire. May had a natural aptitude for charity work. She was an indefatigable worker, and there was no better known figure in the poor streets adjoining the West Indian docks than Sister Nutto. Frank was interested in the work without being enthusiastic. He had all the man's apprehension of infectious disease and of the inadvisability of a beautiful young girl slumming without attendance, but the one visit he had made to the East End in her company had convinced him that there was no fear as to her personal safety. He was wont to grumble that she was more interested in her work than she was in him, which was probably true, because her development had been a slow one, and it could not be said that she was greatly in love with anything in the world save her self-imposed mission. She ate her frugal dinner and drove down to the mission headquarters off the Albert Dock Road. Three nights a week were devoted by the mission to visitation work. Many women and girls living in this area spend their days at factories in the neighborhood, and they have only the evenings for the treatments of ailments which, in people better circumstanced, would produce the attendance of specialists. For the night work, the nurses were accompanied by a volunteer male escort. May Nuttall's duties carried her that evening to Silvertown and to a network of mean streets to the east of the railway. Her work began at dusk and was not ended until night had fallen and the stars were quivering in a hot sky. The heat was stifling, and as she came out of the last foul dwelling, she welcomed as a relief even the vitiated air of the hot night. She went back into the passageway of the house and by the light of a paraffin lamp made her last entry in the little diary she carried. That makes eight we have seen, Thompson, she said to her escort. Is there anybody else on the list? Nobody else tonight, miss, said the young man, concealing a yawn. I am afraid it is not very interesting for you, Thompson, said the girl sympathetically. You haven't even the excitement of work. You must be awfully dull standing outside waiting for me. Bless you, miss, said the man. I don't mind at all. If it is good enough for you to come into these streets, it is good enough for me to go round with you. They stood in a little courtyard, a cul-de-sac cut off at one end by a sheer wall, and as the girl put back her diary into her little net bag, a man came swiftly down from the street entrance of the court and passed her. As he did so, the dim light of the lamp showed for a second his face, and her mouth formed an O oh of astonishment. She watched him until he disappeared into one of the dark doorways at the farther end of the court, and stood staring at the door as though unable to believe her eyes. There was no mistaking the pale face and the straight figure of Jasper Cole, John Minnett's secretary. End of chapter 3
the accountant at the bank. May Nuttall expressed her perplexity in a letter. Dear Frank, such a remarkable thing happened last night. I was in Silver's Rents about eleven o'clock and had just finished seeing the last of my patients when a man passed me and entered one of the houses. It was, I thought at the time, either the last or the last but one on the left. I know now that it was the last but one. There is no doubt at all in my mind that it was Mr. Cole, for not only did I see his face, but he carried the snakewood cane which he always affects. I must confess I was curious enough to make inquiries, and I found that he was a frequent visitor here, but nobody quite knows why he comes. The last house is occupied by two families, very uninteresting people, and the last house but one is empty save for a room which is apparently the one Mr. Cole uses. None of the people in the rents know Mr. Cole or have ever seen him. Apparently the downstairs room in the empty house is kept locked, and a woman who lives opposite told my informant, Thompson, whom you will remember as the man who always goes with me when I am slumming, that the gentleman sometimes comes, uses this room, and that he always sweeps it out for himself. It cannot be very well furnished, and apparently he never stays the night there. Isn't it very extraordinary? Please tell me what you make of it. Frank Merrill put down the letter and slowly filled his pipe. He was puzzled and found no solution either then or on his way to the office. He was the accountant of the Piccadilly branch of the London and Western Counties Bank and had very little time to give to outside problems. But the thought of Cole and his curious appearance in a London slum under circumstances which, to say the least, were mysterious, came between him and his work more than once. He was entering up some transactions when he was sent for by the manager. Frank Merrill, though he did not occupy a particularly imposing post in the bank, held nevertheless a very extraordinary position, and one which ensured for him more consideration than the average official receives at the hands of his superiors. His uncle was financially interested in the bank, and it was generally believed that Frank had been sent as much to watch his relative's interests as to prepare himself for the handling of the great fortune which John Minnett would some day leave to his heir. The manager nodded cheerily as Frank came in and closed the door behind him. "'Good morning, Mr. Merrill,' said the chief. "'I want to see you about Mr. Holland's account. You told me he was in the other day.' Frank nodded. He came in in the lunch hour. "'I wish I had been here,' said the manager thoughtfully. "'I would like to see this gentleman. Is there anything wrong with his account?' Oh, no, said the manager with a smile. He has a very good balance. In fact, too large a balance for a floating account. I wish you would see him and persuade him to put some of his money on deposit. The head office does not like big floating balances which may be withdrawn at any moment and which necessitates the keeping here of a larger quantity of cash than I care to hold. Personally, he went on, I do not like our method of doing business at all. Our head office being in Plymouth, it is necessary, by the peculiar rules of the bank, that the floating balances should be so covered, and I confess that your uncle is as great a sinner as any. Look at this. He pushed a check across the table. Here is a bearer check for sixty thousand pounds, which has just come in. It is to pay the remainder of the purchase price due to consolidated mines. Why they cannot accept the ordinary cross-check, heaven knows. Frank looked at the sprawling signature and smiled. You see, Uncle's got a reputation to keep up, he said good-humouredly. One is not called Ready Money Minute for nothing. The manager made a little grimace. That sort of thing may be necessary in South Africa, he said, but here in the very heart of the money world cash payments are a form of lunacy. I do not want you to repeat this to your relative. I am hardly likely to do that, said Frank though I do think you ought to allow something for Uncle's peculiar experiences in the early days of his career. Oh, I make every allowance, said the other, only it is very inconvenient. But it was not to discuss your uncle's shortcomings that I brought you here. He pulled out a passbook from a heap in front of him. Mr. Rex Holland, he read. He opened his account while I was on my holiday, you remember? I remember very well, said Frank, and he opened it through me. "'What sort of man is he?' asked the manager. "'I'm afraid I am no good at descriptions,' replied Frank, "'but I should describe him as a typical young man about town, 
not very brainy, very few ideas outside of his own immediate world, which begins at Hyde Park Corner and ends at the Hippodrome, interrupted the manager. Possibly, said Frank. He seemed a very sound, capable man in spite of a certain languid assumption of ignorance as to financial matters, and he came very well recommended. What would you like me to do? The manager pushed himself back in his chair, thrust his hands in his trouser pockets, and looked at the ceiling for inspiration. Suppose you go along and see him this afternoon, and ask him as a favor to put some of his money on deposit. We will pay the usual interest and all that sort of thing. You can explain that he can get the money back whenever he wants it by giving us thirty days' notice. Will you do this for me? Surely, said Frank heartily. I will see him this afternoon. What is his address? I have forgotten. Alba Marl Chambers, Nicebridge, replied the manager. He may be in town. And what is his balance? asked Frank. Thirty-seven thousand pounds, said the other, and as he is not buying consolidated mines, I do not see what need he has for the money, the more so since we can always give him an overdraft on the security of his deposit. Suggest to him that he puts thirty thousand pounds with us and leaves seven thousand pounds floating. By the way, your uncle is sending a secretary here this afternoon to go into the question of his own account. Frank looked up. Cole, he said quickly, is he coming here? By Jove! He stood by the manager's desk and a look of amusement came into his eyes. I want to ask Cole something, he said slowly. What time do you expect him? About four o'clock. After the bank closes? The manager nodded. Uncle has a weird way of doing business, said Frank after a pause. I suppose that means that I shall have to stay on? It isn't necessary, said Mr. Brandon. You see, Mr. Cole is one of our directors. Frank checked an exclamation of surprise. How long has this been? he asked. Since last Monday. I thought I told you. At any rate, if you have not been told by your uncle, you had better pretend to know nothing about it, said Brandon hastily. You may be sure I shall keep my counsel, said Frank, a little amused by the other's anxiety. You have been very good to me, Mr. Brandon, and I appreciate your kindness. Mr. Cole is a nominee of your uncle, of course, Brandon went on, with a little nod of acknowledgment for the other's thanks. Your uncle makes a point of never sitting on boards if he can help it, and has never been represented except by his solicitor since he acquired so large an interest in the bank. As a matter of fact, I think Mr. Cole is coming here as much to examine the affairs of the branch as to look after your uncle's account. Cole is a very first-class man of business, isn't he? Frank's answer was a grim smile. Excellent, he said dryly. He has the scientific mind grafted to a singular business capacity. You don't like him? I have no particular reason for not liking him, said the other. Possibly I am being constitutionally uncharitable. He is not the type of man I greatly care for. He possesses all the virtues, according to Uncle, spends his days and nights almost slavishly working for his employer. Oh yes, I know what you are going to say, that it is a very fine quality in a young man, and honestly I agree with you, only it doesn't seem natural. I don't suppose anybody works as hard as I or takes as much interest in his work. Yet I have no particular anxiety to carry it on after business hours. The manager rose. You are not even an idle apprentice, he said good-humouredly. You will see Mr. Rex Holland for me? Certainly, said Frank, and went back to his desk deep in thought. It was four o'clock to the minute when Jasper Cole passed through the one open door of the bank at which the porter stood ready to close. He was well but neatly dressed, and had hooked to his wrist a thin snakewood cane attached to a crook handle. He saw Frank across the counter and smiled, displaying two rows of even white teeth. Hello, Jasper, said Frank easily, extending his hand. How is Uncle? He is very well indeed, replied the other. Of course he is very worried about things, but then I think he is always worried about something or other. Anything in particular? asked Frank interestedly. Jasper shrugged his shoulders. You know him much better than I. You were with him longer. He is getting so horribly suspicious of people, and sees a spy or an enemy in every strange face. That is usually a bad sign, but I think he has been a little overwrought lately. He spoke easily. His voice was low and modulated with the faintest suggestion of a drawl, which was especially irritating to Frank, 
who secretly despised the Oxford product, though he admitted, since he was a very well-balanced and on the whole good-humoured young man, his dislike was unreasonable. "'I hear you have come to audit the accounts,' said Frank, leaning on the counter and opening his gold cigarette case. "'Hardly that,' drawled Jasper. He reached out his hand and selected a cigarette. "'I just want to sort out a few things. By the way, your uncle had a letter from a friend of yours.' "'Mine?' "'A Rex Holland,' said the other. "'He is hardly a friend of mine. "'In fact, he is rather an infernal nuisance,' said Frank. "'I went down to Knightsbridge to see him today, and he was out. "'What has Mr. Holland to say?' "'Oh, he is interested in some sort of charity, "'and he is starting a guinea collection. "'I forget what the charity was.' "'Why do you call him a friend of mine?' asked Frank, "'eyeing the other keenly. "'Jasper Cole was halfway to the manager's office and turned. "'A little joke,' he said. I had heard you mention the gentleman. I have no other reason for supposing he was a friend of yours. Oh, by the way, Cole, said Frank suddenly, were you in town last night? Jasper Cole shot a swift glance at him. Why? Were you near Victoria Docks? What a question to ask, said the other, with his inscrutable smile and, turning abruptly, walked into the waiting Mr. Brandon. Frank finished work at 5.30 that night and left Jasper Cole and a junior clerk to the congenial task of checking the securities. At nine o'clock the clerk went home, leaving Jasper alone in the bank. Mr. Brandon, the manager, was a bachelor and occupied a flat above the bank premises. From time to time he strode in, his big pipe in the corner of his mouth. The last of these occasions was when Jasper Cole had replaced the last ledger in Mr. Minnett's private safe. Half past eleven, said the manager disapprovingly, and you have had no dinner. I can afford to miss a dinner, laughed the other. Lucky man, said the manager. Jasper Cole passed out into the street and called a passing taxi to the curb. Charing Cross Station, he said. He dismissed the cab in the station courtyard, and after a while walked back to the strand and hailed another. Victoria Dock Road, he said in a low voice. End of chapter four. John Minnett's Legacy La Rochefoucauld has said that prudence and love are inconsistent. May Nuttall, who had never explored the philosophies of La Rochefoucauld, had nevertheless seen that quotation in the birthday book of an acquaintance, and the saying had made a great impression upon her. She was twenty-one years of age, at which age girls are most impressionable and are little influenced by the workings of pure reason. They are prepared to take their philosophies ready-made, and not disinclined to accept from others certain rigid standards by which they measure their own elastic temperaments. Frank Merrill was at once a comfort and the cause of a certain half-ashamed resentment, since she was of the age which resents dependence. The woman who spends any appreciable time in the discussion with herself as to whether she does or does not love a man can only have her doubts set at rest by the discovery of somebody whom she loves better. She liked Frank and liked him well enough to accept the little ring which marked the beginning of a new relationship, which was not exactly an engagement, yet brought to her friendship a glamour which it had never before possessed. She liked him well enough to want his love. She loved him little enough to find the prospect of an early marriage alarming. That she did not understand herself was not remarkable. Twenty-one was not the experience by which the complexities of twenty-one may be straightened out and made visible. She sat at breakfast, puzzling the matter out, and was a little disturbed and even distressed to find, in contrasting the men, that of the two she had a warmer and deeper feeling for Jasper Cole. Her alarm was due to the recollection of one of Frank's warnings, almost prophetic it seemed to her now. That man has a fascination which I would be the last to deny. I find myself liking him, though my instinct tells me he is the worst enemy I have in the world. If her attitude toward Frank was difficult to define, more remarkable was her attitude of mind towards Jasper Cole. There was something sinister. No, that was not the word. Something frightening about him. He had a magnetism, an aura of personal power, which seemed to paralyze the will of any who came into conflict with him. She remembered how often she had gone to the big library at Weald Lodge with the firm intention of having it out with Jasper. 
Sometimes it was a question of domestic economy into which he had obtruded his views. When she was sixteen, she was practically housekeeper to her adopted uncle. Perhaps it was a matter of carriage arrangement. Once it had been much more serious, for after she had fixed up to go with a merry picnic party to the Downs, Jasper, in her uncle's absence and on his authority, had firmly but gently forbidden her attendance. Was it an accident that Frank Merrill was one of the party, and that he was coming down from London for an afternoon's fun? In this case, as in every other, Jasper had his way. He even convinced her that his view was right and hers was wrong. He had pooh-poohed on this occasion all suggestion that it was the presence of Frank Merrill which had induced him to exercise the veto which his extraordinary position gave to him. According to his version, it had been the inclusion in the party of two ladies whose names were famous in the theatrical world which had raised his delicate gorge. May thought of this particular incident as she sat at breakfast, and with a feeling of exasperation she realized that whenever Jasper had set his foot down, he had never been short of a plausible reason for opposing her. For one thing, however, she gave him credit. Never once had he spoken depreciatingly of Frank. She wondered what business brought Jasper to such an unsavory neighborhood as that in which she had seen him. She had all a woman's curiosity without a woman's suspicions, and, strangely enough, she did not associate his presence in this terrible neighborhood or his mysterious comings and goings with anything discreditable to himself. She thought it was a little eccentric in him, and wondered whether he, too, was running a little mission of his own, but dismissed that idea since she had received no confirmation of the theory from the people with whom she came into contact in that neighborhood. She was halfway through her breakfast when the telephone bell rang, and she rose from the table and crossed to the wall. At the first word from the caller she recognized him. "'Why, Uncle,' she said, "'whatever are you doing in town?' The voice of John Minnett bellowed through the receiver. I have an important engagement. Will you lunch with me at one thirty at the Savoy? He scarcely waited for her to accept the invitation before he hung up his receiver. The commissioner of police replaced the book which he had taken from the shelf at the side of his desk, swung round in his chair, and smiled quizzically at the perturbed and irascible visitor. The man who sat at the other side of the desk might have been fifty-five. He was of middle height and was dressed in a somewhat violent check suit, the fit of which advertised the skill of the great tailor who would ably fashion so fine a creation from so unlovely a pattern. He wore a low collar which would have displayed a massive neck but for the fact that a glaring purple cravat and a diamond as big as a hazelnut directed the observer's attention elsewhere. The face was an unusual one. Strong to a point of coarseness, the bulbous nose, the thick irregular lips, the massive chin, all spoke of the hard life which John Minnett had spent. His eyes were blue and cold, his hair a thick and unruly mop of grey. At a distance he conveyed a curious illusion of refinement. Nearer at hand his pink face repelled one by its crudities. He reminded the commissioner of a piece of scene painting that pleads from the gallery and disappointed from the boxes. "'You see, Mr. Minnett,' said Sir George suavely, we are rather limited in our opportunities and in our powers. Personally, I should be most happy to help you, not only because it is my business to help everybody, but because you were so kind to my boy in South Africa. The letters of introduction you gave to him were most helpful. The Commissioner's son had been on a hunting trip through Rhodesia and Barrett's land, and a chance meeting at a dinner party with the Rhodesian millionaire had produced these letters. But, continued the official, with a little gesture of despair, Scotland Yard has its limitations. We cannot investigate the cause of intangible fears. If you are threatened, we can help you. But the mere fact that you fancy there is some sort of vague danger would not justify our taking any action. John Minnett hitched about in his chair. What are the police for? he asked impatiently. I have enemies, Sir George. I took a quiet little place in the country, just outside Eastbourne, to get away from London and all sorts of new people are prying round us. There was a new parson called the other day for a subscription to some Boy Scouts movement or other. He has been hanging round my place for a month and lives at a cottage near Polgate. Why should he have come to Eastbourne? On a holiday trip, 
suggested the commissioner. Bah, said John Minnick contemptuously. There's some other reason. I've had him watched. He goes every day to visit a woman at a hotel, a confederate. They're never seen in public together. Then there's a peddler, one of those fellows who sells glass and repair windows. Nobody knows anything about him. He doesn't do enough business to keep a fly alive. He's always hanging round Wheeled Lodge. Then there's a Miss Paynes, who says she's a landscape gardener and wants to lay out the grounds in some new-fangled way. I sent her packing about her business, but she hasn't left the neighborhood. Have you reported the matter to the local police? asked the commissioner. Minute nodded. And they know nothing suspicious about them? Nothing, said Mr. Minute briefly. Then, said the other, smiling, there is probably nothing known against them, and they are quite innocent people trying to get a living. After all, Mr. Minute, a man who is as rich as you are must expect to attract a number of people, each trying to secure some of your wealth in a more or less legitimate way. I suspect nothing more remarkable than this has happened. He leaned back in his chair, his hands clasped, a sudden frown on his face. I hate to suggest that anybody knows any more than we, but as you are so worried, I will put you in touch with a man who will probably relieve your anxiety. Minute looked up. A police officer? he asked. Sir George shook his head. No, this is a private detective. He can do things for you which we cannot. Have you ever heard of Saul Arthur Mann? I see you haven't. Saul Arthur Mann, said the commissioner, has been a good friend of ours and possibly in recommending him to you, I may be a good friend to both of you. He is the man who knows. The man who knows, repeated Mr. Minnett dubiously. What does he know? I'll show you, said the commissioner. He went to the telephone, gave a number, and while he was waiting for the call to be put through, he asked, What is the name of your Boy Scout parson? The Reverend Vincent Locke, replied Mr. Minnett. I suppose you don't know the name of your glass peddler? Minute shook his head. They call him Waxy in the village, he said. And the lady's name is Miss Paynes, I think? asked the commissioner, jotting down the names as he repeated them. Well, we shall... Hello? Is that Saul Arthur Mann? This is Sir George Fuller. Connect me with Mr. Mann, will you? He waited a second and then continued. Is that you, Mr. Mann? I want to ask you something. Will you note these three names? The Reverend Vincent Locke, a peddling glazer who is known as Waxy and a Miss Paynes. Have you got them? I wish you would let me know something about them. Mr. Minnett rose. Perhaps you'll let me know, Sir George, he began holding out his hand. Don't go yet, replied the commissioner, waving him to his chair again. You will obtain all the information you want in a few minutes. But surely he must make inquiries, said the other, surprised. Sir George shook his head. The curious thing about Saul Arthur Mann is that he never has to make inquiries. That is why he is called the man who knows. He is one of the most remarkable people in the world of criminal investigation, he went on. We tried to induce him to come to Scotland Yard. I am not so sure that the government would have paid him his price. At any rate, he saved me any embarrassment by refusing point blank. The telephone bell rang at that moment and Sir George lifted the receiver. He took a pencil and wrote rapidly on his pad, and when he had finished he said, Thank you, and hung up the receiver. Here is your information, Mr. Minute, he said. The Reverend Vincent Locke, curate in a very poor neighborhood near Manchester, interested in the Boy Scouts movement. His brother, George Henry Locke, has had some domestic trouble, his wife running away from him. She is now staying at the Grand Hotel Eastbourne, and is visited every day by her brother-in-law, who is endeavoring to induce her to return to her home. That disposes of the reverend gentleman and his confederate. Miss Paynes is a genuine landscape gardener, has been the plaintiff in two breach of promise cases, one of which came to the court. There is no doubt, the commissioner went on reading the paper, that her modus operandi is to get elderly gentlemen to propose marriage and then to commence her action. That disposes of Miss Paynes, and you now know why she is worrying you. Our friend Waxy has another name, Thomas Cobbler, 
and he has been three times convicted of larceny. The commissioner looked up with a grim little smile. I shall have something to say to our own record department for failing to trace Waxy, he said, and then resumed his reading. And that is everything. It disposes of our three, he said. I will see that Waxy does not annoy you any more. But how the dickens, began Mr. Minnett, how the dickens does this fellow find out in so short a time? The commissioner shrugged his shoulders. He just knows, he said. He took leave of his visitor at the door. If you are bothered any more, he said, I should strongly advise you to go to Saul Arthur Man. I don't know what your real trouble is, and you haven't told me exactly why you should fear an attack of any kind. You won't have to tell Mr. Man, he said with a little twinkle in his eye. Why not? asked the other suspiciously. Because he will know, said the commissioner. The devil he will, growled John Minnett and stumped down the broad stairs on to the embankment, a greatly mystified man. He would have gone off to seek an interview with this strange individual there and then, for his curiosity was piqued and he had also a little apprehension, one which, in his impatient way, he desired should be allayed. But he remembered that he had asked May to lunch with him, and he was already five minutes late. He found the girl in the broad vestibule waiting for him, and greeted her affectionately. Whatever may be said of John Minnett that is not wholly to his credit, it cannot be said that he lacks sincerity. There are people in Rhodesia who speak of him without love. They describe him as the greatest land thief that ever rode a Zetersburg coach from Port Charter to Salisbury to register land that he had obtained by trickery. They tell stories of those wonderful coach drives of his with relays of twelve mules waiting every ten miles. They speak of his gambling propensities, of ten thousand acre farms that changed hands at the turn of a card, and there are stories that are less printable. When Malupi, a little Mashona chief, found gold in ninety two and refused to locate the reef, it was John Minnett who staked him out and lit a grass fire on his chest until he spoke. Many of the stories are probably exaggerated, but all Rhodesia agrees that John Minnett robbed impartially friend and foe. The confidant of Lo Ben and the company alike, he betrayed both, and on that terrible day when it was a toss of a coin whether the concession seekers would be butchered in Lo Ben's crawl, John Minnett escaped with the only available span of mules and left his comrades to their fate. Yet he had big generous traits, and could on occasions be a tender and a kindly friend. He had married when a young man, and had taken his wife into the wilds. There was a story that she had met a handsome young trader, and had eloped with him, that John Minnett had chased them over three hundred miles of hostile country from Victoria Falls to Charter, from Charter to Marandalas, from Marandalas to Massacassi, and had arrived in Bieras so close upon their trail that he had seen the ship which carried them to the Cape steaming down the river. He had never married again. Reports said that the woman had died of malaria. A more popular version of the story was that John Minnett had relentlessly followed his erring wife to Peter Meritsburg and had shot her and had therefore served seven years on the breakwater for his sin. About a man who was rich, powerful, and wholly unpopular, hated by the majority, and feared by all, legends grow as quickly as toadstools on a marshy moor. Some were half true, some wholly apocryphal, deliberate, and malicious inventions. True or false, John Minnett ignored them all, denying nothing, explaining nothing, and even refusing to take action against the Cape Town Weekly which dealt with his career in a spirit of unpardonable frankness. There was only one person in the world whom he loved more than the girl whose hand he held as they went down to the cheeriest restaurant in London. I have had a queer interview, he said, in his gruff, quick way. I have been to see the police. Oh, uncle, she said reproachfully. He jerked his shoulder impatiently. My dear, you don't know, he said. I have got all sorts of people who... He stopped short. What was there remarkable in the interview, she asked, after he had ordered the lunch. Have you ever heard, he asked, of Saul Arthur Mann? Saul Arthur Mann, she repeated. I seem to know that name. Mann, Mann, where have I heard it? Well, said he with that fierce and fleeting little smile which rarely lit his face for a second, if you don't know him, he knows you. He knows everybody. Oh, I remember. 
He is the man who knows. It was his turn to be astonished. Where in the world have you heard of him? Briefly, she retailed her experience, and when she came to describe the omniscient Mr. Men, a crank, growled Mr. Minnett. I was hoping there was something in it. Surely, uncle, there must be something in it, said the girl seriously. A man of the standing of the chief commissioner would not speak about him as Sir George did unless he had very excellent reason. Tell me some more about what you saw, he said. I seem to remember the report of the inquest. The dead man was unknown and has not been identified. She described, as well as she could remember, her meeting with the knowledgeable Mr. Mann. She had to be tactful because she wished to tell the story without betraying the fact that she had been with Frank. But she might have saved herself the trouble, because when she was halfway through the narrative he interrupted her. I gather you were not by yourself, he grumbled. Master Frank was somewhere handy, I suppose. She laughed. I met him quite by accident, she said demurely. Naturally, said John Minnett. Oh, uncle, and there was a man whom Frank knew. You probably know him. Constable Wiseman. John Minnett unfolded his napkin, stirred his soup, and grunted. Wiseman is a stupid ass, he said briefly. The mere fact that he was mixed up in the affair is sufficient explanation as to why the dead man remains unknown. I know Constable Wiseman very well, he said. He has summoned me twice, once for doing a little pistol shooting in the garden just as an object lesson to all tramps, and once, confound him, for a smoking chimney. Oh, yes, I know Constable Wiseman. Apparently the thought of Constable Wiseman filled his mind through two courses, for he did not speak until he set his fish knife and fork together and muttered something about a silly meddling jackass. He was very silent throughout the meal, his mind being divided between two subjects. Uppermost, though of least importance, was the personality of Saul Arthur Mann. Him he mentally viewed with suspicion and apprehension. It was an irritation even to suggest that there might be secret places in his own life which could be flooded with the light of this man's knowledge, and he resolved to beard the man who knows in his den that afternoon and challenge him by inference to produce all the information he had concerning his past. There was much which was public property. It was John Minnett's boast that his life was a book which might be read, but in his inmost heart he knew of one dark place which baffled the outside world. He brought himself from the mental rehearsal of his interview to what was, after all, the first and more important business. May, he said suddenly, have you thought any more about what I asked you? She made no attempt to fence with the question. You mean Jasper Cole? He nodded, and for the moment she made no reply, and sat with eyes downcast, tracing a little figure upon the tablecloth with her fingertip. The truth is, uncle, she said at last, I am not keen on marriage at all just yet and you are sufficiently acquainted with human nature to know that anything which savors of coercion will not make me predisposed toward Mr. Cole. I suppose the real truth is, he said gruffly, that you are in love with Frank? She laughed. That is just what the real truth is not, she said. I like Frank very much. He is a dear, bright, sunny boy. Mr. Minnick grunted. Oh, yes, he is, the girl went on. But I am not in love with him, really. I suppose you are not influenced by the fact that he is my heir, he said, and eyed her keenly. She met his glance steadily. If you were not the nicest man I know, she smiled, I should be very offended. Of course, I don't care whether Frank is rich or poor. You have provided too well for me for mercenary considerations to weigh at all with me. John Minnett grunted again. I am quite serious about Jasper. Why are you so keen on Jasper, she asked. He hesitated. I know him, he said shortly. He has proved to me in a hundred ways that he is a reliable, decent lad. He has become almost indispensable to me, he continued with his quick little laugh, and that Frank has never been. Oh yes, Frank's all right in his way, but he's crazy on things which cut no ice with me. Too fond of sports, too fond of loafing, he growled. The girl laughed again. I can give you a little information on one point, John Minnett went on, and it was to tell you this that I brought you here today. I am a very rich man. You know that. I have made millions and lost them, but I have still enough to satisfy my heirs. I am leaving you two hundred thousand pounds in my will. 
She looked at him with a startled exclamation. Uncle, she said. He nodded. It is not a quarter of my fortune, he went on quickly, but it will make you comfortable after I am gone. He rested his elbows on the table and looked at her searchingly. You are an heiress, he said, for whatever you did, I should never change my mind. Oh, I know you will do nothing of which I should disapprove, but there is the fact. If you marry Frank, you will still get your two hundred thousand, though I should bitterly regret your marriage. No, my girl, he said more kindly than was his wont, I only ask you this, that whatever else you do, you will not make your choice until the next fortnight has expired. With a jerk of his head, John Minnett summoned a waiter and paid his bill. No more was said until he handed her into the cab in the courtyard. I shall be in town next week, he said. He watched the cab disappear in the stream of traffic which flowed along the strand, and calling another taxi, he drove to the address with which the chief commissioner had furnished him. End of chapter 5「The Man Who Knew » Backwell Street, in the city of London, contains one palatial building which at one time was the headquarters of the South American Stock Exchange, a superior bucket shop which on its failure had claimed its fifty thousand victims. The ornate gold lettering on its great plate glass window had long since been removed, and the big brass plate which announced to the passer-by that here sat the spider weaving his golden web for the multitude of flies had been replaced by a modest, oxidized scroll bearing the simple legend, Saul Arthur Mann. What Mr. Mann's business was, few people knew. He kept an army of clerks. He had the largest collection of file cabinets possessed by any three business houses in the city. He had an enormous post-bag, and both he and his clerks kept regulation business hours. His beginnings, however, were well known. He had been a stockbroker's clerk, with a passion for collecting clippings mainly dealing with political, geographical, and meteorological conditions, obtaining in those areas wherein the great joint stock companies of the earth were engaged in operations. He had gradually built up a service of correspondence all over the world. The first news of labor troubled on a gold field came to him, and his brokers indicated his view upon the situation in that particular area by bearing the stock of the affected company. If his Liverpool agent suddenly descended upon the cotton exchange and began buying May cotton in enormous quantities, the initiated knew that Saul Arthur Mann had been awakened from his slumbers by a telegram describing storm havoc in the cotton belt of the United States of America. When a curious blight fell upon the coffee plantations of Ceylon, a 600-word cablegram describing the habits and characteristics of the minute insect which caused the blight reached Saul Arthur Mann at two o'clock in the afternoon, and by three o'clock the price of coffee had jumped. When, on another occasion, Senior Almarez, the president of Kakura, had thrown a glass of wine in the face of his brother-in-law, Captain Vassalaro, Saul Arthur Mann had jumped into the market and beaten down all Kakura stocks, which were fairly high as a result of excellent crops and secure government. He bared them because he knew that Vassalaro was a dead shot, and that the inevitable duel would deprive Kakira of the best president it had had for twenty years, and that the way would be open for the election of Sebastian Romeles, who had behind him a certain group of German financiers who desired to exploit the country in their own peculiar fashion. He probably built up a very considerable fortune, and it is certain that he extended the range of his inquiries until the making of money by means of his Curious Information Bureau became only a secondary consideration. He had a marvelous memory, which was supplemented by his system of filing. He would go to work patiently for months and spend sums of money out of all proportion to the value of the information. To discover, for example, the reason why a district officer in some faraway spot in India had been obliged to return to England before his tour of duty had ended. His thirst for facts was insatiable, his grasp of the politics of every country in the world, and his extraordinarily accurate information concerning the personality of all those who directed those policies, was the basis upon which he was able to build up theories of amazing accuracy. A man of simple tastes, who lived in a rambling old house in Streatham, 
His work, his hobby, and his very life was his bureau. He had assisted the police times without number, and had been so fascinated by the success of this branch of his investigations that he had started a new criminal record, which had been of the greatest help to the police and had piqued Scotland Yard to emulation. John Minnett, descending from his cab at the door, looked up at the imposing fascia with a frown. Entering the broad vestibule, he handed his car to the waiting attendant and took a seat in a well-furnished waiting room. Five minutes later, he was ushered into the presence of the man who knew. Mr. Mann, a comical little figure at a very large writing table, jumped up and went halfway across the big room to meet his visitor. He beamed through his big spectacles as he waved John Minnett to a deep armchair. The chief commissioner sent you, didn't he? he said, pointing an accusing finger at the visitor. I know he did, because he called me up this morning and asked me about three people who, I happen to know, have been bothering you. Now what can I do for you, Mr. Minnett? John Minnett stretched his legs and thrust his hands defiantly into his trousers' pockets. You can tell me all you know about me, he said. Saul Arthur Mann trotted back to his big table and seated himself. I haven't time to tell you as much, he said breezily, but I'll give you a few outlines. He pressed the bell at his desk, opened a big index, and ran his finger down. Bring me 8874, he said impressively to the clerk who made his appearance. To John Minnett's surprise, it was not a bulky dossier with which the attendant returned, but a neat little book soberly bound in grey. Now, said Mr. Mann, wriggling himself comfortably back in his chair, I will read a few things to you. He held up the book. There are no names in this book, my friend, not a single blessed name. Nobody knows who 8874 is except myself. He patted the big index affectionately. The name is there. When I leave this office it will be behind three depths of steel. When I die it will be burned with me. He opened the little book again and read. He read steadily for a quarter of an hour in a monotonous sing-song voice, and John Minnett slowly sat himself erect and listened with tense face and narrow eyelids to the record. He did not interrupt until the other had finished. "'Half of your facts are lies,' he said harshly. "'Some of them are just common gossip. Some are purely imaginary.' Saul Arthur Mann closed the book and shook his head. "'Everything here,' he said, touching the book, "'is true.' It may not be the truth as you want it known, but it is the truth. If I thought there was a single fact in there which was not true, my raison d'etre would be lost. That is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, Mr. Minnett, he went on, and the good-natured little face was pink with annoyance. Suppose it were the truth, interrupted John Minnett. What price would you ask for that record in such documents as you say you have to prove its truth? The other leaned back in his chair and clasped his hands meditatively. "'How much do you think you are worth, Mr. Minnett?' "'You ought to know,' said the other with a sneer. Saul Arthur Mann inclined his head. "'At the present price of securities, I should say about one million two hundred and seventy thousand pounds,' he said. And John Minnett opened his eyes in astonishment. "'Near enough,' he reluctantly admitted. "'Well,' the little man continued, if you multiply that by fifty and you bring all that money into my office and place it on that table in ten thousand pound notes, you could not buy that little book or the records which support it. He jumped up. I am afraid I am keeping you, Mr. Minnett. You are not keeping me, said the other roughly. Before I go, I want to know what use you are going to make of your knowledge. The little man spread out his hands in deprecation. What use? You have seen the use to which I have put it. I have told you what no other living soul will know. How do you know I am John Minnett? asked the visitor quickly. Some twenty-seven photographs of you are included in the folder which contains your record, Mr. Minnett, said the little investigator calmly. You see, you are quite a prominent personage, one of the two hundred and four really rich men in England. I am not likely to mistake you for anybody else, and more than this, your history is so interesting a one that naturally I know much more about you than I should if you had lived the dull and placid life of a city merchant. Tell me one thing before I go, asked Minnett. Where is the person you refer to as X? 
Saul Arthur Mann smiled and inclined his head never so slightly. That is a question which you have no right to ask, he said. It is information which is available to the police or to any authorized person who wishes to get into touch with X. I might add, he went on, that there is much more I could tell you if it were not that it would involve persons with whom you are acquainted. John Minnett left the bureau looking a little older, a little paler than when he had entered. He drove to his club with one thought in his mind, and that thought revolved about the identity and the whereabouts of the person referred to in the little man's record as X. End of chapter 6「Introducing Mr. Rex Holland » Mr. Rex Holland stepped out of his new car and, standing back a pace, surveyed his recent acquisition with a dispassionate eye. « I think she will do, Feltham, he said. The chauffeur touched his cap and grinned broadly. « She did it in thirty-eight minutes, sir. Not bad for a twenty-mile run, half of it through London. »« Not bad, agreed Mr. Holland, slowly stripping his gloves. » The car was drawn up at the entrance to the country cottage which a lavish expenditure of money had converted into a bijou palace. He still lingered, and the chauffeur, feeling that some encouragement to conversation was called for, ventured the view that a car ought to be a good one if one spent eight hundred pounds on it. Everything that is good costs money, said Mr. Rex Holland sententiously, and then continued, Correct me if I am mistaken, but as we came through Putney, did I not see you nod to the driver of another car? Yes, sir. When I engaged you, Mr. Holland went on in his even voice. You told me that you had just arrived from Australia and knew nobody in England. I think my advertisement made it clear that I wanted a man who fulfilled these conditions. Quite right, sir. I was as much surprised as you. The driver of that car was a fellow who travelled over to the old country on the same boat as me. It's rather rum that he should have got the same kind of job. Mr. Holland smiled quietly. I hope his employer is not as eccentric as I and that he pays his servant on my scale. With this shot he unlocked and passed through the door of the cottage. Feltham drove his car to the garage which had been built at the back of the house and once free from observation, lit his pipe and, seating himself on a box, drew from his pocket a little card which he perused with unusual care. He read, 1. To act as chauffeur and valet. 2. To receive ten pounds a week in expenses. 3. To make no friends or acquaintances. 4. Never under any circumstances to discuss my employer, his habits, or his business. 5. Never under any circumstances to go farther eastward into London than is represented by a line drawn from the Marble Arch to Victoria Station. 6. Never to recognize my employer if I see him in the street in company with any other person. The chauffeur folded the card and scratched his chin reflectively. Eccentricity, he said. It was a nice five-syllable word, and its employment was a comfort to this perturbed Australian. He cleaned his face and hands and went into the tiny kitchen to prepare his master's dinner. Mr. Holland's house was a remarkable one. It was filled with every form of labor-saving device which the ingenuity of man could devise. The furniture, if luxurious, was not in any great quantity. Vacuum tubes were to be found in every room, and by the attachment of hose and nozzle and the pressure of a switch each room could be dusted in a few minutes. From the kitchen at the back of the cottage, to the dining room ran two endless belts electrically controlled, which presently carried to the table the very simple meal which his cook chauffeur had prepared. The remnants of dinner were cleared away, the chauffeur dismissed to his quarters, a little one-room building separated from the cottage, and the switch was turned over which heated the automatic coffee percolator which stood on the sideboard. Mr. Holland sat reading, his feet resting on a chair. He only interrupted his study long enough to draw off the coffee into a little white cup and to switch off the current. He sat until the little silver clock on the mantel shelf struck twelve, and then he placed a card in the book to mark the place, closed it, and rose leisurely. He slid back a panel in the wall, disclosing the steel door of a safe. This he opened with a key which he selected from a bunch. From the interior of the safe he removed a cedarwood box, also locked. 
He threw back the lid and removed one by one three checkbooks and a pair of gloves of some thin transparent fabric. These were obviously to guard against telltale fingerprints. He carefully pulled them on and buttoned them. Next he detached three checks, one from each book, and taking a fountain pen from his pocket, he began filling in the blank spaces. He wrote slowly, almost laboriously, and he wrote without a copy. There are very few forgers in the criminal records who have ever accomplished the feat of imitating a man's signature from memory. Mr. Rex Holland was singularly exceptional to all precedent, for from the date to the flourishing signature these checks might have been written and signed by John Minnett. There were the same fantastic E's, the same stiff-tailed Y's. Even John Minnett might have been in doubt whether he wrote the 850 which appeared on one slip. Mr. Holland surveyed his handiwork without emotion. He waited for the inks to dry before he folded the checks and put them in his pocket. This was John Minnett's way, for the millionaire never used blotting paper for some reason, probably not unconnected with an event in his earlier career. When the checks were in his pocket, Mr. Holland removed his gloves, replaced them with the checkbooks in the box and in the safe, locked the steel door, drew the sliding panel, and went to bed. Early the next morning he summoned his servant. Take the car back to town, he said. I am going back by train. Meet me at the Holland Park Tube at two o'clock. I have a little job for you which will earn you five hundred. That's my job, sir, said the dazed man when he recovered from the shock. Frank sometimes accompanied me to the East End, and on the day Mr. Rex Holland returned to London he called for the girl at her flat to drive her to Canning Town. You can come in and have some tea, she invited. You're a luxurious beggar, May, he said, glancing round approvingly at the prettily furnished sitting room. Contrast this with my humble abode in Bayswater. I don't know your humble abode in Bayswater, she laughed. But why on earth should you elect to live at Bayswater, I can't imagine. He sipped his tea with a twinkle in his eye. Guess what income the heir of the minute millions enjoys, he asked ironically. No, I'll save you the agony of guessing. I earn seven pounds a week at the bank, and that is the whole of my income. But doesn't, uncle? she began in surprise. Not a bob, replied Frank vulgarly. Not half a bob. But... I know what you're going to say. He treats you generously, I know. He treats me justly. Between generosity and justice, give me generosity all the time. I will tell you something else. He pays Jasper Cole a thousand a year. It's very curious, isn't it? She leaned over and patted his arm. Poor boy, she said sympathetically. That doesn't make it any easier. Jasper, I mean. Frank indulged in a little grimace and said... By the way, I saw the mysterious Jasper this morning, coming out of the Waterloo station looking more mysterious than ever. What particular business has he in the country? She shook her head and rose. I know as little about Jasper as you, she answered. She turned and looked at him thoughtfully. Frank, she said, I am rather worried about you and Jasper. I am worried because your uncle does not seem to take the same view of Jasper as you take. It is not a very heroic position for either of you, and it is rather hateful for me. Frank looked at her with a quizzical smile. Why hateful for you? She shook her head. I would like to tell you everything, but that would not be fair. To whom? Frank asked quickly. To you, your uncle, or to Jasper? He came nearer to her. Have you so warm a feeling for Jasper? he asked. I have no warm feeling for anybody, she said candidly. Oh, don't look so glum, Frank. I suppose I am slow to develop, but you cannot expect me to have any very decided views yet a while. Frank smiled ruefully. That is my one big trouble, dear, he said quietly, bigger than anything else in the world. She stood with her hand on the door, hesitating, a look of perplexity upon her beautiful face. She was of the tall, slender type, a girl slowly ripening into womanhood. She might have been described as cold and a little repressive, but the truth was that she was as yet untouched by the fires of passion, and for all her twenty-one years she was still something of the healthy schoolgirl, with a schoolgirl's impatience of sentiment. 
I am the last to spin a hard luck yarn, Frank went on, but I have not had the best of everything, dear. I started wrong with Uncle. He never liked my father, nor any of my father's family. His treatment of his wife was infamous. My poor governor was one of those easy-going fellows who was always in trouble, and it was always John Minnett's job to get him out. I don't like talking about him. He hesitated. She nodded. I know, she said sympathetically. Father was not the rotter that Uncle John thinks he was. He had his good points. He was careless, and he drank much more than was good for him, but all the scrapes he fell into were due to this latter failing. The girl knew the story of Dr. Merrill. It had been sketched briefly but vividly by John Minnett. She knew also some of those scrapes which had involved Dr. Merrill's ruin, material and moral. Frank, she said, if I can help you in any way, I would do it. You can help me absolutely, said the young man quietly, by marrying me. She gasped. When? she asked, startled. Now, next week, in any rate soon. He smiled and crossing to her, caught her hand in his. May, dear, you know I love you. You know there is nothing in the world I would not do for you, no sacrifice that I would not make. She shook her head. You must give me some time to think about this, Frank, she said. Don't go, he begged. You cannot know how urgent is my need of you. Uncle John has told you a great deal about me, but has he told you this, that my only hope of independence, independence of his millions and his influence, you cannot know how widespread or pernicious that influence is, he said, with an unaccustomed passion in his voice, lies in my marriage before my twenty-fourth birthday? Frank! It is true. I cannot tell you any more, but John Minnett knows. If I am married within the next ten days, he snapped his fingers, that for his millions. I am independent of his legacies, independent of his patronage. She stared at him open-eyed. You never told me this before. He shook his head a little despairingly. There are some things I can never tell you, May, and some things which you can never know till we are married. I only ask you to trust me. But suppose, she faltered, you are not married within ten days. What will happen? He shrugged his shoulders. I am John's liege man of life and limb and of earthly regard, he quoted flippantly. I shall wait hopefully for the only release that can come, the release which his death will bring. I hate saying that, for there is something about him that I like enormously. That is the truth, and May, he said, still holding her hand and looking earnestly into her face, I don't want to feel like that about John Minnett. I don't want to look forward to his end. I want to meet him without any sense of dependence. I don't want to be looking all the time for signs of decay and decrepitude, and hail each illness he may have with a feeling of pleasant anticipation. It is beastly of me to talk like this, I know, but if you were in my position, if you knew all that I know, you would understand. The girl's mind was in a ferment. An ordinary meeting had developed so tumultuously that she had lost her command of the situation. A hundred thoughts ran riot through her mind. She felt as though she were an arbitrator deciding between two men, of both of whom she was fond. And even at that moment, there intruded into her mental vision a picture of Jasper Cole, with his pale intellectual face and his grey dark eyes. I must think about this, she said again. I don't think you had better come down to the mission with me. He nodded. Perhaps you're right, he said. Gently she released her hand and left him. For her that day was one of supreme mental perturbation. What was the extraordinary reason which compelled his marriage by his twenty-fourth birthday? She remembered how John Minnett had insisted that her thoughts about marriage should be at least postponed for the next fortnight. Why had John Minnett suddenly sprung this story of her legacy upon her? For the first time in her life she began to regard her uncle with suspicion. For Frank, the day did not develop without its sensations. The Piccadilly branch of the London and Western Counties Bank occupies commodious premises, but Frank had never been granted the use of a private office. His big desk was in a corner remote from the counter, surrounded on three sides by a screen which was half glass and half teak paneling. From where he sat he could secure a view of the counter, a necessary provision, since he was occasionally called upon to identify the bearers of checks. 
He returned a little before three o'clock in the afternoon, and Mr. Brandon, the manager, came hurriedly from his little sanctum at the rear of the premises and beckoned Frank into his office. "'You've taken an awful long time for lunch,' he complained. "'I'm sorry,' said Frank. "'I met Miss Nuttall, and the time flew. "'Did you see Holland the other day?' the manager interrupted. "'I didn't see him on the day you sent me,' replied Frank. "'But I saw him on the following day. "'Is he a friend of your uncle's?' "'I don't think so. Why do you ask?' "'The manager took up three checks which lay on the table, and Frank examined them. One was for eight hundred and fifty pounds six shillings, and was drawn upon the Liverpool Cotton Bank. One was for forty-one thousand one hundred and forty pounds, and was drawn upon the Bank of England, and the other was for seven thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine pounds fourteen shillings. They were all signed John Minnett, and they were all made payable to Rex Holland, Esquire, and were crossed. Now John Minnett had a very curious practice of splitting up payments so that they covered the three banking houses at which his money was deposited. The cheque for £7,999.14 shillings was drawn upon the London and Western Counties Bank, and that would have afforded the manager some clue even if he had not been well acquainted with John Minnett's eccentricity. £7,999.14 shillings for Mr. Minnett's balance, said the manager, leaves exactly £50,000. Mr. Brandon shook his head in despair at the unbusinesslike methods of his patron. Does he know your uncle? Who? Rex Holland. Frank frowned in an effort of memory. I don't remember my uncle ever speaking of him, and yet, now I come to think of it, one of the first checks he put into the bank was on my uncle's account. Yes, now I remember, he exclaimed. He opened the account on a letter of introduction which was signed by Mr. Minnett. I thought at the time that they had probably had business dealings together, and as Uncle never encourages the discussion of bank affairs outside of the bank, I have never mentioned it to him. Again Mr. Brandon shook his head in doubt. I must say, Mr. Merrill, he said, I don't like these mysterious depositors. What is he like in appearance? Rather a tall, youngish man, exquisitely dressed. Clean-shaven? No, he has a closely trimmed black beard though he cannot be much more than twenty-eight. In fact, when I saw him for the first time, the face was familiar to me, and I had an impression of having seen him before. I think he was wearing a gold-rimmed eyeglass when he came on the first occasion, but I have never met him in the street, and he hardly moves in my humble social circle. Frank smiled. I suppose it is all right, said the manager dubiously, but anyway, I'll see him tomorrow. As a precautionary measure, we should get in touch with your uncle. I know he'll raise Cain if we bother him about his account. He will certainly raise Cain if you get in touch with him today, smiled Frank, for he is due to leave by the 2.20 this afternoon for Paris. It wanted five minutes to the hour at which the bank closed, when a clerk came through the swing door and laid a letter upon the counter, which was taken into Mr. Brandon, who came into the office immediately and crossed to where Frank sat. Look at this, he said. Frank took the letter and read it. It was addressed to the manager and ran, Dear Sir, I am leaving for Paris tonight to join my partner, Mr. Minnett. I shall be very glad, therefore, if you will arrange to cash the enclosed check. Yours faithfully, Rex A. Holland. The enclosed check was for £55,000, and was within £5,000 of the amount standing to Mr. Holland's account in the bank. There was a postscript to the letter. You will accept this, my receipt for the sum, and hand it to my messenger, Sergeant George Graylin, of the Corps of Commissionaires, and this form of receipt will serve to indemnify you against loss in the event of mishap. The manager walked to the counter. Who gave you this letter? he asked. Mr. Holland, sir, said the man. Where is Mr. Holland? asked Frank. The sergeant shook his head. At his flat. My instructions were to take this letter to the bank and bring back the money. The manager was in a quandary. It was a regular transaction, and it was by no means unusual to pay out money in this way. It was only the largeness of the sum which made him hesitate. He disappeared into his office and came back with two bundles of notes which he had taken from the safe. He counted them over, placed them in a sealed envelope, and received from the sergeant his receipt. When the man had gone, Brendan wiped his forehead. 
Phew, he said. I don't like this way of doing business very much, and I should be very glad indeed to be transferred back to the head office. The words were hardly out of his mouth when a bell rang violently. The front doors of the bank had been closed with the departure of the commissioner, and one of the junior clerks, balancing up his daybook, dropped his pen, and, at a sign from his chief, walking to the door, pulled back the bolts and admitted, John Minnett. Frank stared at him in astonishment. Hello, uncle, he said. I wish you had come a few minutes before. I thought you were in Paris. The wire calling me to Paris was a fake, growled John Minnett. I wired for confirmation and discovered my Paris people had not sent me any message. I only got the wire just before the train started. I had been spending all the afternoon getting on to the phone to Paris to untangle the muddle. Why did you wish I was here five minutes before? Because, said Frank, we have just paid out fifty-five thousand pounds to your friend, Mr. Holland. My friend? John Minnett stared from the manager to Frank and from Frank to the manager, who suddenly experienced the sinking feeling which accompanies disaster. What do you mean, my friend? asked John Minnett. I had never heard of the man before. Didn't you give Mr. Holland checks amounting to fifty-five thousand pounds this morning? gasped the manager, turning suddenly pale. Certainly not, roared John Minnett. Why the devil should I give him checks? I have never heard of the man. The manager grasped the counter for support. He explained the situation in a few halting words and led the way to his office, Frank accompanying him. John Minnett examined the checks. That is my writing, he said. I could swear to it myself, and yet I never wrote those checks or signed them. Did you note the commissioner's number? As it happens, I jotted it down, said Frank. By this time, the manager was on the phone to the police. At seven o'clock that night, the commissioner was discovered. He had been employed, he said, by a Mr. Holland, whom he described as a slimish man, clean-shaven, and by no means answering to the description which Frank had given. I have lived for a long time in Australia, said the commissioner, and he spoke like an Australian. In fact, when I mentioned certain places I had been to, he told me he knew them. The police further discovered that the Knightsbridge flat had been taken, furnished three months before by Mr. Rex Holland, the negotiations having been by letter. Mr. Holland's agent had assumed responsibility for the flat, and Mr. Holland's agent was easily discoverable in a clerk in the employment of a well-known firm of surveyors and auctioneers, who had also received his commission by letter. When the police searched the flat, they found only one thing which helped them in their investigations. The hall porter said that, as often as not, the flat was untenanted, and only occasionally, when he was off duty, had Mr. Holland put in an appearance, and he only knew this from statements which had been made by other tenants. It comes to this, said John Minnett grimly, that nobody has seen Mr. Holland but you, Frank. Frank stiffened. I am not suggesting that you are in the swindle, said Minnett gruffly. As likely as not, the man you saw was not Mr. Holland, and it is probably the work of a gang. But I am going to find out who this man is, if I have to spend twice as much as I have lost. The police were not encouraging. Detective Inspector Nash from Scotland Yard, who had handled some of the biggest cases of bank swindles, held out no hope of the money being recovered. In theory, you can get back the notes if you have their numbers, he said, but in practice, it is almost impossible to recover them, because it is quite easy to change even notes for 500 pounds, and probably you will find these in circulation in a week or two. His speculation proved to be correct, for on the third day after the crime, three of the missing notes made a curious appearance. Ready Money Minute, true to his nickname, was in the habit of balancing his accounts as between bank and bank by cash payments. He had made it a practice for all his dividends to be paid in actual cash, and these were sent to the Piccadilly branch of the London and Western Counties Bank in bulk. After a payment of a very large sum on account of certain dividends accruing from his South African investments, three of the missing notes were discovered in the bank itself. John Minnett, apprised by telegram of the fact, said nothing for the money had been paid in by his confidential secretary, Jasper Cole, and there was excellent reason why he did not desire to emphasize the fact. End of chapter 7 
Sergeant Smith calls. The big library of Weald Lodge was brilliantly lighted, and nobody had pulled down the blinds, so that it was possible for any man who troubled to jump the low stone wall which ran by the road and push away through the damp shrubbery to see all that was happening in the room. Weald Lodge stands between Eastbourne and Wilmington, and in the winter months the curious represented by youthful holiday-makers are few and far between. Constable Wiseman, of the Eastbourne Constabulary, certainly was not curious. He paced his slow, moist way and merely noted, in passing, the fact that the flood of light reflected on the little patch of lawn at the side of the house. The hour was nine o'clock on a June evening, and officially it was only the hour of sunset, though lowering rain clouds had so darkened the world that night had closed down upon the weald, had blotted out its pleasant villages and had hidden the green downs. He continued to the end of his beat and met his impatient superior. "'Everything's all right, Sergeant,' he reported. "'Only old minutes lights are blazing away and his windows are open.' "'Better go and warn him,' said the sergeant, pulling his bicycle into position for mounting. He had his foot on the treadle, but hesitated. "'I'd warn him myself, but I don't think he'd be glad to see me.' He grinned to himself, then remarked, "'Something queer about minute, eh?' There is indeed, agreed Constable Wiseman heartily. His beat was a lonely one, and he was a very bored man. If by agreement with his officer he could induce that loquacious gentleman to talk for a quarter of an hour, so much dull time might be passed. The fact that Sergeant Smith was loquacious indicated, too, that he had been drinking and was ready to quarrel with anybody. Come under the shelter of that wall, said the sergeant and pushed his machine to the protection afforded by the side wall of a house. It is possible that the sergeant was anxious to impress upon his subordinate's mind a point of view which might be useful to himself one day. Minute is a dangerous old man, he said. Don't I know it, said Constable Wiseman, with the recollection of sundry reportings and inquiries. You got to remember that, Wiseman, the sergeant went on. And by dangerous, I mean that he's the sort of old fellow that would ask a constable to come in to have a drink and then report him. Good Lord, said the shocked Mr. Wiseman, at this revelation of the blackest treachery. Sergeant Smith nodded. That's the sort of man he is, he said. I knew him years ago. At least I've seen him. I was in Matabella land with him, and I tell you there's nothing too mean for ready money minute. Curse him. I'll bet you have had a terrible life, Sergeant, encouraged Constable Wiseman. The other laughed bitterly. I have, he said. Sergeant Smith's acquaintance with Eastbourne was a short one. He had only been four years in the town, and had, so rumor ran, owed his promotion to influence. What that influence was, none could say. It had been suggested that John Minnett himself had secured him his sergeant's stripes, but that was a theory which was pooh-poohed by people who knew that the sergeant had little that was good to say of his supposed patron. Constable Wiseman, a profound thinker and a secret reader of sensational detective stories, had at one time made a report against John Minnett for some technical offense, and had made it in fear and trembling, expecting his sergeant promptly to squash this attempt to persecute his patron. But to his surprise and delight, Sergeant Smith had furthered his efforts and had helped to secure the conviction which involved a fine. "'You go on and finish your beat, Constable,' said the sergeant suddenly, "'and I'll ride up to the old devil's house and see what's doing.' He mounted his bicycle and trundled up the hill, dismounting before Weald Lodge, and propped his bicycle against the wall. He looked for a long time toward the open French windows, and then, jumping the wall, made his way slowly across the lawn." avoiding the gravel path which would betray his presence. He got to a point opposite the window which commanded a full view of the room. Though the window was open, there was a fire in the grate. To the sergeant's satisfaction, John Minnett was alone. He sat in a deep armchair in his favorite attitude, his hands pushed into his pockets, his head upon his chest. He heard the sergeant's foot upon the gravel and stood up as the rain-drenched figure appeared at the open window. Oh, it's you, is it? growled John Minnett. What do you want? Alone, said the sergeant, and he spoke as one to his equal. Come in. 
Mr. Minnett's library had been furnished by the Artistic Furniture Company of Eastbourne, which had branches at Hastings, Bexhill, Brighton, and it was claimed at London. The furniture was of dark oak, busily carved. There was a large bookcase which half covered one wall. This was the library, and it was filled with books of uniform binding which occupied the shelves. The books had been supplied by a great bookseller of London, and included, at Mr. Minnett's suggestion, the hundred best books, books that have helped me, the Encyclopedia Brillonica, and twenty bound volumes of a certain weekly periodical of international reputation. John Minnett had no literary leanings. The sergeant hesitated, wiped his heavy boots on the sodden mat outside the window, and walked into the room. "'You are pretty cozy, John,' he said. "'What do you want?' asked Minnett without enthusiasm. "'I thought I'd look you up. My constable reported your windows were open, and I felt it my duty to come along and warn you. There are thieves about, John.' "'I know of one,' said John Minnett, looking at the other steadily. Your constable, as you call him, is, I presume, that thick-headed jackass Wiseman. Got him first time, said the sergeant, removing his waterproof cape. I don't often trouble you, but somehow I had a feeling I'd like to see you tonight. My constable revived old memories, John. Unpleasant for you, I hope, said John Minnett ungraciously. There's a nice little gold farm four hundred miles north of Guello, said Sergeant Smith meditatively. And a nice little breakwater half a mile south of Cape Town, said John Minnett, where the Cape government keeps highwaymen who hold up the Salisbury coach and rob the mails. Sergeant Smith smiled. You will have your little joke, he said, but I might remind you that they have plenty of accommodation on the breakwater, John. They even take care of men who have stolen land and murdered natives. What do you want? asked John Minnett again. And the other grinned. Just a pleasant little friendly visit, he explained. I haven't looked you up for twelve months. It is a hard life, this police work, even when you have got two or three pounds a week from a private source to add to your pay. It is nothing like the work we have in the Matabele Mounted Police, eh, John? But, Lord, he said, looking into the fire thoughtfully, when I think how I stood up in the attorney's office at Salisbury and took my solemn oath that old John Getting had transferred his Sabak gold claims to you on his deathbed, when I think of the amount of perjury, me, a uniformed servant of the British South African Company, and, so to speak, an official of the law, I blush for myself. Do you ever blush for yourself when you think of how you and your pals held up Hoffman's store, shot Hoffman, and took his swag? asked John Minnett. I'd give a lot of money to see you blush, Crawley, and now, for about the fourteenth time, what do you want? If it is money, you can't have it. If it is more promotion, you are not fit to have it. If it is a word of advice... The other stopped him with a motion of his hand. I can't afford to have your advice, John, he said. All I know is that you promised me my fair share over those Sabak claims. It is a paying mine now. They tell me that its capital is two millions. You were well paid, said John Bennett shortly. Five hundred pounds isn't much for the surrender of your soul's salvation, said Sergeant Smith. He slowly replaced his cape on his broad shoulders and walked to the window. Listen here, John Minnett. All the good nature had gone out of his voice, and it was Trooper Henry Crawley, the lawbreaker, who spoke. You are not going to satisfy me much longer with a few pounds a week. You have got to do the right thing by me, or I am going to blow. Let me know when your blowing starts, said John Minnett and I'll send you a bowl of soup to cool. You're funny, but you don't amuse me, were the last words of the sergeant as he walked into the rain. As before, he avoided the drive and jumped over the low wall onto the road, and was glad that he had done so, for a motor car swung into the drive and pulled up before the dark doorway of the house. He was over the wall again in an instant, and crossing with swift, noiseless steps in the direction of the car. He got as close as he could and listened. Two of the voices he recognized. The third, that of a man, was a stranger. He heard this third person called Inspector, and wondered who was the guest. His curiosity was not to be satisfied, for by the time he had reached the view place on the lawn which overlooked the library, John Minnett had closed the windows and pulled down the blinds. The visitors to Weald Lodge were three. 
Jasper Cole, May Nuttall, and a stout middle-aged man of slow speech but authoritative tone. This was Inspector Nash, of Scotland Yard, who was in charge of the investigations into the forgeries. Minnett received them in the library. He knew the inspector of old. Jasper had brought May down in response to the telegraphed instructions which John Minnett had sent him. "'What's the news?' he asked. "'Well, I think I have found your Mr. Holland,' said the inspector. He took a fat case from his inside pocket, opened it, and extracted a snapshot photograph. It represented a big motor car, and standing by its bonnet, a little man in a chauffeur's uniform. This is the fellow who called himself Rex Holland, and who sent the commissionaire on his errand. The photograph came into my possession as the result of an accident. It was discovered in the flood and had evidently fallen out of the man's pocket. I made inquiries and found that it was taken by a small photographer in Putney, and that the man had called for the photographs about ten o'clock in the morning of the same day that he sent the commissionaire on his errand. He was probably examining them during the period of his waiting in the flat, and one of them slipped to the ground. At any rate, the commissioner has no doubt that this was the man. Do you seriously suggest that this fellow was Rex Holland? The inspector shook his head. I think he is merely one of the gang, he said. I don't believe you will ever find Rex Holland, for each of the gang took the name in turn to take the part, according to the circumstances in which they found themselves. I have been unable to identify him, except that he went by the name of Feltham and was an Australian. That was the name he gave to the photographer with whom he talked. You see, the photograph was taken in High Street, Putney. The only clue we have is that he has been seen several times on the Portsmouth Road, driving one or two cars in which was a man who is probably the nearest approach to Rex Holland we shall get. I put my men on to make further investigations, and the Hasselmere police told them that it is believed that the car was the property of a gentleman who lived in a lock-up cottage some distance from Hasselmere. Evidently rather a swagger affair, because its owner had an electric cable and telephone wires laid in, and the cottage was altered and renovated twelve months ago at a very considerable cost. I shall be able to tell you more about that tomorrow. They spent the rest of the evening discussing the crime, and the girl was a silent listener. It was not until very late that John Minnett was able to give her his undivided attention. I asked you to come down, he said, because I am getting a little worried about you. Worried about me, uncle? she said in surprise. He nodded. The two men had gone off to Jasper's study, and she was alone with her uncle. When I lunched with you the other day at the Savoy, he said, I spoke to you about your marriage, and I asked you to defer any action for a fortnight. She nodded. I was coming down to see you on that very matter, she said. Uncle, won't you tell me why you want me to delay my marriage for a fortnight, and why you think I am going to get married at all? He did not answer immediately, but paced up and down the room. May, he said, you have heard a great deal about me which is not very flattering. I lived a very rough life in South Africa, and I only had one friend in the world in whom I had the slightest confidence. That friend was your father. He stood by me in my bad times. He never worried me when I was flush of money, never denied me when I was broke. Whenever he helped me, he was content with what reward I offered him. There was no fifty-fifty with Bill Nuttall. He was a man who had no ambition, no avarice, the whitest man I have ever met. What I have not told you about him is this. He and I were equal partners in a mine, the Guello Deep. He had great faith in the mine, and I had none at all. I knew it to be one of those properties you sometimes get in Rhodesia, all pocket and outcrop. Anyway, we floated a company. He stopped and chuckled as at an amusing memory. The pound shares were worth a little less than sixpence until a fortnight ago. He looked at her with one of those swift, penetrating glances, as though he were anxious to discover her thoughts. A fortnight ago, he said, I learned from my agent in Bulawayo that a reef had been struck on an adjoining mine, and that the reef runs through our property. If that is true, you will be a rich woman in your own right, apart from the money you get from me. I cannot tell you whether it is true until I have heard from the engineers, who are now examining the property, and I cannot know that for a fortnight. 
May, you were a dear girl, he said, and laid his hand on her arm. And I have looked after you as though you were my own daughter. It is a happiness to me to know that you will be a very rich woman, because your father's shares was the only property you inherited from him. There is, however, one curious thing about it that I cannot understand. He walked over to the bureau, unlocked a drawer, and took out a letter. My agent says that he advised me two years ago that this reef existed, and wondered why I had never given him authority to bore. I have no recollection of his ever having told me anything of the sort. Now you know the position, he said, putting back the letter and closing the drawer with a bang. You want me to wait for a better match, said the girl. He inclined his head. I don't want you to get married for a fortnight, he repeated. May Nuttall went to bed that night full of doubt and more than a little unhappy. The story that John Minnett told about her father, was it true? Was it a story invented on the spur of the moment to counter Frank's plan? She thought of Frank in his almost solemn entreaty. There had been no mistaking his earnestness or his sincerity. If he would only take her into his confidence, and yet she recognized and was surprised at the revelation that she did not want that confidence. She wanted to help Frank very badly, and it was not the romance of the situation which appealed to her. There was a large sense of duty, something of that mother sense which every woman possesses, which tempted her to sacrifice. Yet was it a sacrifice? She debated that question half the night, tossing from side to side. She could not sleep, and rising before the dawn, slipped into her dressing gown and went to the window. The rain had ceased, clouds had broken and stood in black bars against the silver light of dawn. She felt unaccountably hungry, and after a second's hesitation she opened the door and went down the broad stairs to the hall. To reach the kitchen she had to pass her uncle's door, and she noticed that it was ajar. She thought possibly he had gone to bed and left the light on, and her hand was on the knob to investigate when she heard a voice and drew back hurriedly. It was the voice of Jasper Cole. I have been into the books very carefully with Mackinson, the accountant, and there seems no doubt, he said. You think, demanded her uncle. I am certain, answered Jasper in his even passionless tone. The fraud has been worked by Frank. He had access to the books. He was the only person who saw Rex Holland. He was the only official at the bank who could possibly falsify the entries and at the same time hide his trail. The girl turned cold and for a moment swayed as though she would faint. She clutched the jamb of the door for support and waited. "'I am half inclined to your belief,' said John Minnett slowly. "'It is awful to believe that Frank is a forger, as his father was. Awful!' "'It is pretty ghastly,' said Jasper's voice. "'But it is true.' The girl flung open the door and stood in the doorway. "'It is a lie!' she cried wrathfully. "'A horrible lie! And you know it is a lie, Jasper!' Without another word she turned, slamming the door behind her. End of chapter 8